Hello and welcome to The Intentional Clinician. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. Today's episode will be a solo episode. I won't be interviewing anyone. However, I will be using my own story, stories I've heard, quotes from authors and philosophers and writers I like, to illustrate many points. I will be discussing culture, attitudes, life in our modern world. It's really hard to break this episode down into a quick summary. Some of the topics I will be covering are people's desire to feel whole, what do we do when we're disappointed, injured, traumatized, depressed, and have an episode in our lives. I will be discussing um, what we do when we're overwhelmed and how do we deal with life where there seems to be so many different things um, trying to fill up our time. I talk about the risk involved in the unpredictability of life and should we just kind of crawl into a corner and what do we do when things don't work out and I talk a lot about what do you do if you don't know what your passion is and what path to take and how do we start something and what do we do if something doesn't work out and then I also talk about how to become a master at something and talking about how the everyday life can actually be interesting it depends how we're viewing it That's just some of what I'll be talking about, so I hope you enjoy it. Most of us want to feel congruent about our thoughts and actions, and people will do all sorts of things in life, both healthy and unhealthy, to achieve the feeling of wholeness and congruency. I know that some of us may have memories of a time we felt whole, and some of us do not. One definition of the word whole that was interesting to me was this, in an unbroken or undamaged state, in one piece. In the journey of life, it is inevitable that we will face suffering in one form or another, as will everyone we know. So it is no wonder that many of us feel broken and damaged all the time. Yet there are many ways and paths and practices to start feeling whole again, even though life has broken us multiple times and we will carry scars from things that have happened our entire life. We can still feel whole. Of course, scars are not a terrible thing to have, as long as we can make meaning out of the scar, tell a story about the scar, maybe even joke about the scar, and accept the scar in this present moment, uh, we will not be divided. Scars can be an okay thing to carry if we feel congruent about our actions and our subsequent thoughts and feelings in the present day. While the process of being scarred may not be fair, may not make any sense, and may be one of the most terrible things you've ever dealt with in your life, it is easier to deal with a scar if you are congruent now about what happened, you've made meaning, and you're working towards wholeness. This is surely a discussion that could continue in countless books, podcasts, and conversations, but I'm going to aim to provide three simple points with examples today that will help us walk through the concept of moving from fragmentation into wholeness. I do not believe that anyone ever achieves complete wholeness, but we are certainly able to experience moments of wholeness. We can feel congruency in our actions and our thoughts, our belief systems, and even through our brokenness, difficult experiences, and trying times in life, we can feel more fully human. I am sure that these concepts will come up again in future podcasts and blogs, but here we go today. I'm going to start off with a quote about wholeness that spoke to me. Here's the quote by Parker J. Palmer. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. I love quotes, but it is also important to consider the context from which they are spoken. So I'm going to tell you I am quoting his book, A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey Toward an Undivided Life by Parker J. Palmer. He's an amazing author and teacher. If you haven't read his books, I highly recommend them. I will put links in the show notes. I'm going to read that quote again. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Remember, in life, we are not aiming for perfection. We are aiming to be in agreement with our actions, forgiving ourselves when we are not in agreement. Wholeness is, in a sense, acceptance of oneself and where you are in that moment. Now that we've got a basis for what we're talking about, I'm going to talk about moving from a fragmented and divided life to feeling whole again in three parts. I'm going to use some stories and some information I've read to illustrate 
my points, and by the end, hopefully you'll have some practical information that you can use in your life. Part one, a thousand options for dinner. Our modern life is full of distractions, quote, easy answers and gateways to addiction. The nonstop availability of information that is available 24 hours a day in all forms of media and entertainment, services, advertising, marketing, organizations, so many things out there can have an overwhelming effect on our minds, bodies, and our psyche, otherwise known as the soul. There are countless ways and paths that can cause us to change from being mindful and knowing what's going on to getting into autopilot mode, where we become immersed in consumption or distraction and possibly other harmful activities. We're not cultivating our relationships with others or even ourselves. By the time we get a moment to reflect on our lives and our habits, we will find ourselves sometimes feeling fragmented in our activities, our work, and even divided in our heart about how we're feeling. When I use the word heart, I am not talking about our actual physical heart. I am speaking metaphorically of the emotional feelings that most people experience in their torso and chest. Usually these feelings are accompanied by thoughts in the brain, which are noticed by what we call the mind. If we feel fragmented and divided a lot of the time, it can be difficult to focus, figure out what our true feelings about something are, understand what we want to do with our lives or relationships, or even know what to do with our time. I was at a psychology conference in 2009, and I heard James Hillman say something like this in his lecture. Most people are fine working on goals and therapy, yet the most resistance I have ever encountered is when I try to treat someone's schedule. He was making a joke, but I think it was a commentary on our modern society. In the book Essentialism by Greg McNoan, he commented on our current society's overwhelming amount of options. I'm summarizing some of his concepts here with my own thoughts added. In the United States in 2017, we have far too many choices. So many choices can cause decision fatigue. The more decisions we are forced to make, the more the quality of our decisions decrease. We have too much pressure regarding our decisions. Much more social pressure if you are connected to social media or exposed to advertisements on the TV, magazines, or the internet. And now we have the explosion of opinion overload from social media and the advent of so-called fake news websites and others. And of course, mix this all in with the American myth that we can have it all, which is just not true. People working to buy so much stuff that they don't even know what to do with it. They don't even have time to enjoy it. And this can lead to ignoring valuable relationships, ignoring our inner life, our inner thoughts, and sometimes can lead to long periods of hardly engaging in some of the most important years of our lives. With all of this constant noise in our modern culture, how do we distinguish things of value from the vacuous? When we are overwhelmed with options, oftentimes we don't even notice our own thoughts and our inner voice. We go into autopilot mode. Self-awareness and moving towards self-actualization is part of becoming whole. In doing this inner work, we will learn how to discern what is necessary and what is not. It can help us move out of fragmentation and into a state of wholeness. But how do we have self-awareness in this land of constant noise and entertainment? You can find your own ways to do this, but I'm just going to list a few of those I've found. The most simple answer is we need time, we need space, and we need some stillness. And when we get stillness, we can unplug. We can become more intentional. We can have space in our lives to figure out what we are doing, why we are doing it, and what we want to do. It doesn't have to be that much time. I know a lot of people are very busy with so many things, but there are also a lot of non-essential things we're doing. If we figure out what we're entangled in and evaluate it, we can figure out what is necessary and what is not. Some examples of unplugging and finding space and stillness is taking time out to uh, do mindfulness meditations. Mindfulness is being aware of the present moment without judgment, which you can do all day if you're practicing being aware. Some people take 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to kind of sit still, sometimes listen to something, or just be in nature. 
Uh, some other people do this through prayer. A lot of people in the newer generations are turned off by organized relig religion, but that doesn't mean we should abandon any sense of spirituality or looking for larger answers. So in some people's worlds, prayer is a way to do this. Reconnecting with nature, getting out of the hustle and bustle of the city, um, reading, just finding some quiet, finding some stillness, working on not filling up our schedule to the brim, taking some time to journal or just think, have some reflection, contemplation, and even ask yourself questions like, what is missing in my life? What do I need? What am I constantly thinking about, but not talking about? What do I really want to say to people? What do I really want to do with my time? What makes my heart sing? What brings me joy? What is something I'm doing that I get no pleasure from, but I'm just doing it to keep up appearances? A lot of this is getting down to the truth about how we really feel inside. There's this quote by George Orwell that says, In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And I believe that this is not only the case in the way George Orwell meant it possibly in society or the news media, but in our inner lives as well. Even reading poetry can open us up to our awareness. As T.S. Eliot said, Poetry may make us a little more aware of the deeper, unnamed feelings which form the substratum of our being, to which we rarely penetrate, for most of our lives are mostly a constant evasion of ourselves. The lesson begins with inner work and working to figure out how we truly feel. There's this African proverb that says, when there is no enemy within, the enemies outside cannot hurt you. So taking some time out to really evaluate what we're doing, how we're spending our time, who we're surrounding ourselves with, what is essential, what's not essential, can really help us start to be more intentional. Now, I'm talking about putting aside time to be alone, to contemplate and have reflection, is just a practice in becoming whole. It's not an answer. It's not a magic bullet. It is not a lifestyle. It's not like isolation. What we're talking about is just taking a little time out of our day or out of our week, a little space, a little stillness, a little time to contemplate and think and write, or just dream and take a walk. We still, of course, need time for relationships, people, animals in our lives, and we need to have meaning in what we're doing with our time. So. I'm not advocating isolation, but just taking a little time, whatever that means for you, every week to intentionally do this. In the next section, I will address other obstacles to wholeness, as well as ways to try to feel whole, and the need for community. So I hope you've enjoyed part one, which was called A Thousand Options for Dinner. Part two, from simplicity to the unpredictable road of life. If we were lucky enough to have loving and mindful parents, life may have seemed simple when we were little. We learn the rules, we play, we eat, we go to sleep, repeat. Now, if we had a difficult childhood, we may have felt fragmented and divided from the very beginning. And we may still be seeking to feel whole for the first time. Yet, in a childhood where things were simple, one day we start going to school, which can seem fun and joyful until the first time you remember someone attacking you, verbally or physically. Some sort of mini trauma or major trauma occurred. I certainly remember my bubble being burst on the first day of school in first grade. I was introducing myself to a third grader on the soccer field, and I said, hi, my name is Paul. What's your name? And he said back to me, Paul? What kind of name is Paul? That is not cool, and then ran off. I remember being shocked. Why would he say that? Was he telling the truth? Was my name really not cool? I started to feel shame. What did this say about my parents? They were the ones who named me. Other thoughts continued. Why would he pick on me just because he didn't think my name was cool? 
How am I going to fit in? Am I even welcome on the soccer field? What do I do now? I started right there to feel fragmented and divided and even not welcome on my first day of school. Now, of course, this was not the first nor the last time I experienced any sort of division in my life or problems. There were many other instances in my neighborhood and school which occurred before this incident and after. I'm not using this as an autobiography. I'm just using this experience to illustrate a point. How many of you remember a flashpoint? A moment when you went from thinking and feeling that you were safe, that you were a good person, that you looked nice in your new outfit, that things were going okay, we were having fun, and the next moment, that idea was shattered by a person saying something to you or doing something to you or an unexpected event. We all have a story. We all have a life narrative, and most of our narratives are full of many of these micro events. Some of them are true large traumas. And many times events and relationships can break us and hurt us deeply. And sometimes we've been the one hurting people. We have been hurt and we've grown hard in our hearts and we rationalize that it's okay to treat others with disrespect and treat them as subhuman. Whatever the case, this part is about the unpredictable road of life and what happens to us and how do we heal from that what do we do i'm going to get to that there's many ideas about this but there is this somebody told me that in japan broken objects such as family bowls or plates are often repaired with gold when they get a break or cut in them the flaw in these pieces are seen as a unique part of the object's history, which adds to its beauty. So in Japan, right there, that metaphor, we have these cracks in our bowls and plates, but we're going to re repair them with gold. And we're just seeing that as unique and not as some sort of problem with the dish or the bowl. So if something happens to you that's terrible and hurts your life immensely, the problem is not with you. The problem is what happened with the event. Oftentimes, when something bad happens, our brain starts to blame ourselves. And that's often tragic because then the trauma continues to bother us in the present day. Some of us experience traumatic events in our life that are so serious, they can negatively impact our mental health for months, even years, and cause various problems in our relationship and lives. Even if you haven't had a serious trauma happen, you've probably had things that shaped you and shaped how you behave today. In a future podcast, I'm going to talk all about trauma and getting intensive treatment and counseling in other ways. And if you do have a trauma in your life that continues to bother you or afflict you or make you behave in a certain way, it's very important to get treatment and reach out for that. There are resources on my website about that. But this is more about wounding and what to do with that. What are some ways to deal with that? Um... There are some ways to, some quotes about this where it's framed a little differently. J.K. Rowling said, You will never truly know yourself or the strength of your relationships until both have been tested by adversity. And Rilke said, Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. What story are you telling yourself? Were you able to integrate a bad experience into part of your story? with you overcoming and you moving past it? Or is this experience crushing your self-esteem and self-worth even now? It's important to be honest with ourselves. Are we in denial that something terrible happened? Are we hiding our feelings about it? Are we hiding our anger? Are we just ashamed? The first step is often to acknowledge that the harm was done. The next step is often just to speak it and bring it out. The hard part is to struggle with shaming and blaming ourselves for it. It's important to get treatment, like I said before, if you are struggling and seem to not be able to get past a trauma or a difficult experience in life. But another part is getting into some type of community with people where you can feel safe and you are able to have authentic conversations about difficult topics. So finding some type of community, a place to feel safe, a circle of trust, so to speak, a mentor, 
an organization to be a part of where you can be open, a support group, um, listening to a friend and having them listen to you. And if you can't find any of that, again, I do advocate people get professional treatment. Parker Palmer in his book I discussed earlier, but there is this concept about how this isn't trying to fix you, or and we're not trying to fix others when we listen to them and talk about our pain and our difficulties. We are trying to get to know them and have their voice and their story be heard. Even in counseling, I'm not aiming to fix people. I have methods and techniques to try to help people heal from their trauma, but I don't want to fix them. I know that they know what's best for their lives. Oftentimes, we have to be with them in their suffering as they go through it, as they find their own way. Oftentimes, though, we've been hurt even by a community where people give us glib advice. Well, at least this didn't happen, or could have been worse, or, well, at least you're not in a third world country, or, gee, you're kind of exaggerating. Can't be that bad. So that can be very hurtful, which is why it's important to um, find out who is safe to talk to about difficult and deep subjects before delving into them. There was this part from Parker Palmer's uh, book uh, that I mentioned earlier. He wrote, The shadow, meaning the dark side, behind the fixes we offer for issues that we cannot fix is, ironically, the desire to hold each other at bay. It is a strategy for abandoning each other while appearing to be concerned. Perhaps this explains why one of the most common laments of our time is that, quote, no one really sees me, hears me, or understands me. How can we understand another when instead of listening deeply, we rush to repair that person in order to escape further involvement? The sense of isolation and, and invisibility that marks so many lives, not least the lives of young people who we constantly try to fix, is due in part to a mode of, quote, helping that allows us to dismiss each other. When you speak to me about your deepest questions, you do not want to be fixed or saved. You want to be seen and heard, to have your truth acknowledged and honored. If your problem is soul deep, your soul alone knows what you need to do about it, and my presumptuous advice will only drive your soul back into the woods. So the best service I can render when you speak to me about such a struggle is to hold you faithfully in a space where you can listen to your inner teacher. And so that really spoke to me and kind of ties section one and section two together because in section one I'm talking about taking time out to evaluate what you're doing and listen to what's going on inside. And in section two, Parker Palmer is talking about finding community that will hold you and respect and listen to how your story without trying to fix you or judge you and how that will help you find your way through it. And that's one way through difficult times finding a community that you can do that and tell your story and there is some real healing there. Part three, how do I start something when I don't know what path to take? I believe this is very connected with moving from a fragmented and divided life to feeling whole again. Um, oftentimes, if people don't know what to do, there's so many options, so many paths, so many opportunities, they feel completely divided and fragmented. In fact, when presented with so many directions and choices for your life, people can feel paralyzed by indecision and anxiety. When you, we are young children, many of our paths are chosen for us. It is only over time that we gain a sense of self and may eventually strive for autonomy or individuation from our parents or caretakers. In some ways, our experience as children can inhibit or enhance our desire for certain paths depending on who our parents or caretakers are as people, where we live, what opportunities are presented to us, and even socioeconomic status can influence us. Yet many people eventually come to a place where they are old enough or aware enough to choose a path, no matter what limitations have limited them in their lives. Oftentimes I talk to people who, no matter what their age, are unsure of what to do with their lives and what path to take. They feel fragmented and divided. They are afraid of committing to any path at all. Many times they present with a great deal of anxiety and feel stuck in their lives. Some even experience depression because of this. Yet each and every one of us, with help, can work to find something of interest to us and even begin small steps of pursuing a related goal, which is a way of finding a path, whether it be a hobby, a vocation, a relationship, a community, 
a group, a new way of spending our time. Each and every one of us could change our lives in a small way and move down a path to pursue something of interest, which can eventually lead to a new way of being. I'm eventually going to do a podcast on career and vocation, which will touch on this more in detail. But today I'm going to tell a little bit of my story and how I eventually found the path I decided to take. This is not an autobiography, of course, but a rough overview of some events which led me to where I am today. In many ways, my childhood was a nice experience. In other ways, it was very confusing and frustrating. I had two parents who loved me, a place to live, and food on the table. I grew up in a lower socioeconomic status, but my parents were decently educated. I did have many opportunities to meet a lot of people and learn from them. Yet to my detriment, I did not have too much consistency in my life. For instance, for various reasons, I attended three different elementary schools and two different high schools. And as a young person, I was ashamed because I couldn't play sports, instruments, or even act as well in plays as many of my peers could. When I was young, I assumed it was all my fault, that I was just untalented. I wasn't born with that gift. It wasn't until I was 15 that I realized if I didn't start to change my path and my attitude, I was going to become very unhappy as an adult. That realization came after, I believe, was which was one of my first long periods of depression, where I isolated for a while and didn't attend many events at my school or in any community groups. After that, I decided I needed to change. I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I took up working out, cooking, reading more vigorously, playing the piano, and singing. I demanded to change schools and environments to give me a new point of view, and luckily I was able to. I had always been a reader because my parents limited my television consumption until I was about 13, and computer use was still only a class at school. Yet even with this change, I still wasn't talented right away in many ways. This is because I had never consistently followed through with music lessons or even sports practice before the age of 15. Sure, I tried things out for a while, maybe even for a season, but I was not forced to continue. I would usually start something and then stop out of frustration, because I didn't have the raw talent. I had heard that the key to becoming good at something was, quote, practice, 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 but like most children, I didn't listen to my parents or teachers. I would only learn this by an example of others who did practice, and of course, my own trial and error. Luckily, at my new school, I made some good friends who actually did follow the mantra, practice, practice, practice. Around age 15, they did influence me to change and work on my skills in a variety of areas. Once I started prioritizing my interests and devoting my time to learning and practicing different things, my life began to change. First of all, I was excited that I had found new interests, like playing music and acting and singing and even playing some sports. And by practicing, over time, I could even see my skills improving. Second of all, I was able to start shedding some of my negative shame of thinking I just lack the talent. Another benefit of applying myself was that I also learned that I did not like to do everything. I learned that some things I just didn't care for, which was very important to slightly narrowing my path and helping me find a general direction for what I did like to do. At that point, I still didn't know I was interested in psychology or counseling. I'm going to skip over many pivotal areas of my story at this point in the podcast because this is not an episode about how I became a counselor. That's a story for another day. Suffice to say, I had a lot of experiences in school, and I had a series of menial jobs starting in adolescence and continuing through my college days. These jobs, whether in fast food, hospitality, labor, painting, writing, and editing, and even a camera person at a local TV station, helped me define what I did like and mostly what I didn't like. I very quickly decided that I did not want to work at a fast food restaurant for a career, nor a motel. I didn't enjoy tons of physical labor, and while I enjoyed the physical exercise of the labor job, I couldn't imagine myself doing that for 40 years. I didn't like painting. I realized that while I liked writing and editing my own work or my friend's work, I really didn't like the job of editing and helping others write. And most astonishingly, I learned that I did not like the lifestyle and hours and pressure that accompanied working at the local television station. Ironically, even after dropping my telecommunications major in college, I still worked as a camera person for four years. It was fun and relatively easy, but that was because the pressure had been lifted that I had to do this for a career. What I did during my late high school and college years was really explore. I didn't just sit in a room and type in an internet search, what should I do with my life? 
I went out and tried a bunch of different jobs. I also worked at exposing myself to new situations, different people from different cultures and their opinions. This exposure brought me out of my comfort zone and helped me learn more about the values that they had and my own values in return. It helped me figure out how they had found their path to what they were doing and, and knew that I had to continue to search to figure out what I wanted to do. And tying back into the concept of wholeness, I had a lot of different jobs and they showed me something else I wasn't really aware of until much later. I noticed that I felt energized when I worked these two jobs in particular during college. One was mentoring younger students in the residence halls and another was volunteering at a local middle school. At the time, I thought, oh, I'll be a teacher, and I went to pursue an education degree. But later on, after a year of working in high schools, I realized that wasn't for me. My path was not to become a traditional teacher, but I did find that I loved working with people, and that led me to psychology and eventually to become a counselor. I'm greatly summarizing my story to make a global point about being intentional with practice, but also to say, if you don't know what path you're on, it's important to try things and really immerse yourself in a variety of experiences and jobs so you can figure out what you like and what you don't like. I think experience is one of the greatest teachers. I want to say that having all these jobs and breaking out of my comfort zone was not easy. I was literally terrified most of the time. Yet, after each new experience, I became less nervous. I will discuss anxiety in a future podcast for sure. I had many times where I felt like I had failed because I didn't like the job I was doing, or I had great expectations of this new experience or meeting or job, and then it didn't turn out to be as good as I had thought in my mind. During this time, I had plenty of doubts and periods where I was depressed, like I thought I would never find out what I wanted to do. Yet, I remember someone once told me that 99% of life was just showing up. So I kept showing up most of the time, in spite of my doubt. And I knew already that I didn't want to work an hourly wage job for the rest of my life. I didn't come from money, quite the opposite, so I could not depend on my parents for much support. Yet out of this time of uncertainty, I grew as a person. Growing and learning are values that are very dear to me. I don't ever want to stop growing or learning because anytime I grow stagnant and begin living on autopilot, my joy and happiness as well as my excitement about life decreases. So I still constantly pursue learning and growing and attempt to work on my weaknesses to this very day. Public speaking is not one of my strong fronts. And I've never attempted a podcast or a spoken word recording until The Intentional Clinician, which is episode two right now. So I'm just learning as I go. When you're first trying a new activity or skill and you're learning how to do it, you're not going to be very good at it. It will not feel effortless. You won't just be a, quote, natural. Some people will comment when watching a talented individual that they're a natural at something like sports or violin or whatever. I just don't believe that. While certain people seem to have amazing abilities in an area or a skill, I believe the only way you can really get there to have these abilities is to be intentional and have a deliberate practice. You aren't just born an Olympic athlete or a world-class chess player. These are skills that need to be developed over time. According to some researchers, it takes about 10,000 hours of practice to become a master at a new skill. Well, now I know I'm well over 10,000 hours providing psychotherapy, also known as counseling, as I've been a licensed counselor since 2007. It's fun. I love what I do. I love helping people find their voice to heal, to change, to meet their goals. And counseling can be quite challenging, but I found it to be very rewarding. Similarly to practicing my counseling skills, um, I practice them through trainings, mentorship, evaluation, working with people. All of the hobbies that I started when I was a teenager and cultivated through intentional practice eventually became joys in my life. For instance, I may not be the best pianist, bicyclist, or cook, but I've gotten to a skill level where I actually enjoy practicing and performing these skills. So if you are struggling with whatever you're trying to do, sports, crafts, socializing, writing, singing, playing an instrument, cooking, you may not have had enough deliberate practice, and maybe you haven't received instruction or helpful feedback. So whatever you're doing, don't give up. If you want to start something, if you want to become good at something, if you have a dream, don't quit just because you aren't great at the beginning. Get feedback. Work on setting a schedule for deliberate practice. Help get some lessons in that area from somebody who's already good at it. There's a writer I really like named Malcolm Gladwell. 
and he wrote in his book Outliers that about 10,000 hours of appropriately guided practice was the magic number of greatness, regardless of a person's natural aptitude. So basically, if somebody is practicing or doing something for about 10,000 hours in their life, and they've got instruction and feedback and are deliberately working on it, they can become what we can call a master. Gladwell claims that with enough practice, almost anyone can achieve a level of proficiency that would rival that of a professional. It was just a matter of putting in the time with proper instruction and help. K. Anders Erickson is the professor who Gladwell is uh, quoting in his book, The Outliers. He took his research. He's uh, a professor of psychology at Florida State University. Um, his research began the dialogue, of course, on the 10,000-hour rule that Gladwell wrote. And I read uh, recently in an article that Professor Erickson said that this claim of people becoming a master or becoming uh, gaining skill to the level of a professional appears true aside from physical limitations, of course, which he said can be a constraint for growth and progress in an area. So given the opportunity, unless there's some physical um, limitations or mental limitations, somebody can become a master at something, which is really great news for a lot of people who think that they're just not talented enough to do something and then they quit when it's difficult or when they're not getting the results. Like I quit many times. I quit playing the piano. I quit doing all these things I love to do over and over because I wasn't at the level where I wanted to be when I was younger. There's a quote by someone named Mike Newland. He said, genius is perseverance in disguise. So of course, perseverance is when we're we're refusing to quit. We're continuing to go against all odds. We're just going and going and going. And then, and so someday somebody may perceive us as a genius because we're really good at something. But you're saying, no, I am not a genius. I just kept trying. And then I got to this level of knowledge or expertise or talent. I became great at bowling because I just persevered and I got lessons and I worked on it for years. Aristotle stated, we are what we repeatedly do. I'm going to read that again. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. So in a sense, again, we're working on having a habit of doing something, and we're repeatedly trying to do it, and then we can become excellent at it. Something I like to tell people is this. Remember, perfection is a myth. We see it in myth all the time. These archetypes of perfection. Um, the Greek gods, for instance, were archetypes of different types of perfections, although they all had flaws. And we build up sports heroes in our head, sometimes like Michael Jordan was this perfect basketball player. But he's really just a guy. Have you seen him play baseball? I mean, he's just a guy, like everyone else. I say this, remember, perfection is a myth. Don't let others' wonderful talents and skills stop you from starting something. I'm going to repeat that. Don't let others' wonderful talents and skills stop you from starting. Carl Rogers, who was a great psychologist here in the 20th century in the United States, said, The good life is a process, not a state of being. It is a direction, not a destination. And in a sense, I'm taking that as the good life is a process, meaning feeling good about your life. It's not just like something you get to one day where you just feel great all the time. It's working through things. It's a direction. You're going towards a goal. You may not know what you're going to do when you get there. You may not know what to do, but it's not just somewhere you get to. It's following that direction, following your goals. I use this metaphor sometimes. Um, we're climbing you know, we can see a mountain top in the distance. It's in the clouds in the fog. We know we're going towards some type of mountain top. We want to become great at something. We want to achieve a goal. We want to have a relationship. We want to have a family, whatever it is. But we don't really know the path up the mountain. We're going to go to the right a little bit. We're going to go down. We're going to go east. We're going to go west. We're going to go, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. But we know that if we keep getting up and keep going towards the mountaintop, somehow we're going to get there. But we can't see the path because that means we could see the future. And we can't see the future. Oftentimes in my life, I was judgmental of something, such as, for instance, 
uh, in a counseling clinic, they wanted me to go to a certain training to work with teenagers. And I had no desire at the time to do so, but they said, hey, it's a free training and we're paying for it and we really need you to go. So I went and I eventually learned all of these skills through the training and I had feedback on tapes that I actually loved and I learned to really help teenagers for about five years of my life. And now those same skills I can apply to adults. I just have to change the language. But I learned an invaluable thing and I was not even interested in the topic. I wanted to work with adults, not teenagers. And uh, that's what I thought was the best idea, but I didn't know. I couldn't see that the future in this would help me in some way. It seemed like a detour, but it was really a process of helping me open up to new possibilities and learn new things. So I tell you, anyone who's listening, whatever it is you're interested in, just do it. Just start something. Put aside some time to work on yourself, a skill, work on a project, or even a relationship. I mean, relationships are a whole nother podcast because, of course, you have to have the other person have interest as well. But uh, if you don't like what you're doing or you realize it's not for you, stop. Do something else. I don't know. The average college student, I think, changes their major somewhere around four or five times. I think they should change their majors more times than that. I think that we should have college students totally confused and take the first year just to go around and interview people actually working in jobs and ask them, how did you get here? How did you get to this job? Do you like this job? Tell me the pros and cons of it. Then we could figure out what to study. Not just, hey, pick a major, kids. Welcome to college. And then you're locked in because you already spent money on it. There's this quote by Goeth. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. So be bold. Try it out. Do it. There's another quote that feeds right into that. Don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Seize common occasions and make them great. Arias and Sweat Martin. So don't wait for extraordinary opportunities. Don't wait for the funding. This is, uh, I am friends with a lot of musicians, and we used to have this joke where we're like, well, if we just had this extra microphone, if we just had this, then we could make the perfect song. It's like, no, just go write the song and record it on a tape and you'll get, you'll learn from that. It'll be better and better. And that's how things generally go. You have to write, I always joke, you have to write a hundred terrible songs before you write one you're proud of. And I think based on my life, I can say that's true. I'm finally liking the songs I'm writing and I would actually listen to them before. I was just like, ah, oh, what is this stuff? Uh, but I kept trying because I liked it. I liked writing songs. So whatever you're doing, why not take the risk? Try something, put your art out there, put your skills out there, apply for a job. You can always change your mind later if you decide this job isn't for you. If you're not sure what to do, again, most of us learn by experience. I discussed earlier having a variety of jobs as a young person, and it certainly informed me what I did not like doing. <laughs> as well of, you know, I also learned parts of each job I did like doing. Uh, one time I worked in this pizza parlor that will remain nameless for copyright reasons, and um, I just loved the customer interaction. I had so much fun working with the people that would come in and goof around and hang out, and I hated making pizzas. Ugh, it was awful. And cleaning. Oh, I hate cleaning. But I realized through that, and I kept getting out of pizza making and cleaning, which my friends were jealous about. But I learned from that that customer interaction and, and talking to these people that would come into the pizza parlor was a form of social skill, which is something I use to this day as a counselor. Um, so many people I talk to have this idea to write a book. And, I, and then I, I ask them, have you ever written anything? Have you written a short story, a poem? Have you even written a journal about your own life? And they'll often say no. And I said, yeah, I don't like to give people advice, but I say, well... If I were you, I would try writing something before I start writing a novel. That seems like a large endeavor. Um, when obstacles arise, you change your direction to reach your goal. You do not change your decision to get there. Again, when obstacles arise, you change your direction to reach your goal. You do not change your decision to get there. That's Zig Ziglar. I love that. Um, I actually started the Intentional Clinician as a training program for healthcare professionals, and I've done a few presentations using that name, and I'm still going to use it. But then one day, I thought, well, why not try making it into this podcast blog thing? So here I am doing it. We'll see what happens with it. Maybe it'll turn into something else. I don't know. 
my goal is to become more intentional and to give the world some of my thoughts and my experiences and hopefully make the world a better place. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and kind of getting to the end here, uh, living in a culture of easy answers, quote unquote, and instant gratification, that's where we live right here if you live in the United States in uh, 2017. This can lead one to be disappointed. Um, you know, if something isn't amazing right away, we just throw it in the trash. So I say, don't aim for perfection again. Aim to do something. Action is the most difficult part. The starting is the most difficult part. I, I've heard a saying in yoga class, which I sometimes attend. The fact that you got to your yoga mat today means that you have succeeded. Uh, which sounds nice, and maybe it's a bunch of fluff because they want me to keep coming. But I actually think that's true because I once I get to the class, I like it. I I feel great. I feel stretched out because I sit a lot, and I feel more energized. But I hate going. I'm like, oh, yoga. I have to go to yoga. I need to go to yoga. My body is telling me to go to yoga. My brain is telling me, you need an hour break. You need to go sit there for an hour, even if you're terrible. And I'm always the worst person in the class. One of my nicknames is the Tin Man because I can't bend very well. But the point was, if I got to the yoga mat, this one teacher told me, you've succeeded, which is true because then I'm there. And even though it's totally imperfect and everyone else has seemed to levitating and bending like Gumby, I, I'm there and I'm doing my best. So we have to show up to get results. That's part of that. Remember, 99% of life is showing up. You can't really prove that, but that's how I feel. Part of living an undivided life where we feel more whole is related to paying attention to how we spend our time and what we have decided to prioritize and intentionally practice. So if you're going back to part one using some reflection time, these are some questions you can ask yourself when you're sitting there in silence and just wait for the answers. Write down all the answers you get. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your spare time? What are your goals? Okay. How much of your time or spare time is aligned with your goals? And how much of it is aligned to pointless tasks or busy work? Do you even know what your interests are? If money was not an object, what would you be doing? Do you know who your true friends are? Are you so worried about finding true love that you don't even talk to people that could be potential partners, even as a friendship? Are you satisfied in your career? What is one thing that you would like to do more of? What is one relationship that makes you really feel special? These are just some examples. Um, just getting underneath what's going on in our lives, getting into the deep stuff. I always say this, if you want to do something big, you have to start small. And I hate that. I, I would love to do big things in my brain, everything. I, I have got these great ideas. Oh, this would be so cool if I did this podcast and people listen. Oh, I'd love to make this album and see if people loved it. But you've got to start from scratch. And that's where I'm starting right here. There's this quote. I'm not sure if it relates, but I like it. Remember, the world is changed by your example, not your opinion. That's Paulo Colo. He wrote The Alchemist and a bunch of other books. And uh, I think I only read The Alchemist. I've got a few other ones. I need to read those. Remember, the world is changed by your example, not your opinion. So we can all talk about what we would love to do and what we want to do, but the world is changed by example. Um, that means actions and not words will help you reach your goal. Everyone thought electric cars were a great idea for years, and, and I remember seeing them in the 90s at some sort of expo. But then uh, Elon Musk started bringing it into the mainstream by just making them. And now Ford and Chevy are following, and there's some new place called Lucid Motors, and it's kind of a new trend. So, interesting. No matter where you are on your path, there is always an opportunity for change. It is possible to move from a fragmented and divided life toward a life where you feel wholeness. Remember from part one, we must learn to unplug, be still, and listen. We must learn to determine what we value and how, where, and with whom we want to spend our time. That way we can learn to be intentional with it. From part two, we learned uh, it is important to acknowledge 
and own our own wounds and brokenness as a person. It is vital that we heal, and we cannot do it alone. We need the help of others and a safe and affirming community to do so. And if that doesn't work, make sure you get professional help because you can get better with help. And in part three, which I've been in, we've discussed the difficulties of discovering what we enjoy doing, the challenges of getting started, and what to do if we learn we don't like the path we are on, and right here at the end, ways to grow and intentionally cultivate our skills and gifts. I hope that something in today's episode spoke to you. Remember, even if you have had terrible and bad experiences and do not feel like taking action, you are worth the investment of time to, con- to contemplate your life. You're worth the time of friends and having friends and a community. It is never too late to begin doing what you really want to do and living how you want to live. I had an old friend who used to say to people, he would just say this to them, your life has value. And he would just be quiet after that. And I thought that was just amazing uh, because your life does have value. As a human being, you deserve love and respect. And oftentimes in the world, systems and people and powers that be uh, forget that we're all human. They're the same as you and we're the same as them. And then other things get in the way. People get hurt. Until next time on The Intentional Clinician, I will leave you the words of Leonard Cohen from his song Anthem. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm wishing you all the will to keep going and keep growing. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. This has been The Intentional Clinician with Paul Krause. Currently, I have a private practice in Grand Rapids, Michigan. If you would like to work with me and you live in the Grand Rapids area, you can give me a call, 616-365-5530. That's 616-365-5530. If you live in the state of Michigan, I can also do telemedicine practice uh, and do distance counseling in that way if the situation is appropriate. I also have several colleagues that share an office with me. I have fantastic counselors in the office that all have their own specialty. You can find out about them on my other website, healthforlifegr.com. That's health for life, the letter is G, the letter R is in Grand Rapids.com. If you want to learn more about my practice, you can go to paulkrauscounseling.com. And if you're in need of a clinical supervisor and you're in the Grand Rapids area, you can check out counselingsupervisorgr.com, which discusses my group supervision. Also in our office, I failed to mention, at Health for Life, we have two board-certified naturopathic physicians, Dr. Nicole Kane and Dr. Shannon Bennett. And you can find out more about them at healthforlifegr.com or www.drnicolecain.com. All right. Hopefully we can help you out if you are in the area. And I am also licensed in Arizona. And I did also fail to mention that Dr. Nicole Kane is in Arizona for several months of the year and does see patients in Scottsdale as well. Scottsdale, Arizona being a suburb of Phoenix. You can find out more about that by calling the front desk at 616-200-4433. That's 616-200-4433. All right, everyone, have a great week. Until next time. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss, and while these are based upon the literature he has read and his experience in the field, they should not be viewed as the definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in need of counseling, don't hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with Paul or one of his associates if you're in the Grand Rapids area by going to healthforlifegr.com. If you are in need, please go to your local doctor, emergency room, or anywhere else that's appropriate. If you are in crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Line, which is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. There is always hope, even if you can't see it.
you do when you don't feel like you have any passion? How do you start things? Oh, there's a cell phone going on. That's funny. Okay. Hilarious. And there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed it. Enjoyed it.